muted. More about what we're going to be doing today in our webinar. So with that, I'm going to switch this over to Robin. And we'll give a couple moments for her to get her screen ready to share out. All right, great. Um, so now we're at the agenda part of the program. Um, again, my name is Robin Burns. I'm the program director at City Sprouts, and we're based in Massachusetts and Boston and Cambridge. And I'll tell you a little bit more about City Sprouts in a little bit, a little while um, after we go through some of the other case studies here on the webinar. But just again, a recap of who is here presenting. So it's City Sprouts, Gardeners, Common Grounds, Connecticut, and the Ecology Center, as John mentioned before. Um, the focus for our webinar is around assessment and evaluation of school garden programs, particularly looking at internal program evaluation. And then towards the end, we'll have um, resources that will be available and we'll tell you more about some other studies and different um, types of evaluation that your organization might be able to be a part of. We're going to take a dive into the four different organizations and look at each one as a case study for a different way of doing assessment or evaluation of a program. And we're going to review the factors that really help you identify which are the right evaluation tools for uh, your organization. And as I mentioned, we'll finish up with some additional resources and definitely want to leave a lot of time at the end for question and answers. I know I usually find that the most valuable part of a presentation often is just that dialogue that happens um, at the end. So we'll save a lot of time for that. And that's me, Robin Burns. And um, we wanted to highlight the School Garden Support Organization, organization document that was created um, in December, as John alluded to, the, the second uh, gathering is coming up this December. Um, and one of the one of the working groups that evolved throughout that that week long uh, gathering was this group that was focused on identifying and measuring impact. And the five keys that the group identified are for rationales for program evaluation were to improve effectiveness, justify growth and replication, inspire and empower school garden support organization staff in the school community, sharing the organizational story, and checking the pulse of an intervention. And there are definitely other things that you might be able to identify and some of the, which we might allude to in our presentation here, but these are the ones that we kept coming back to as the five most um, common or important rationales. And with that, I'm going to share the first poll, which is coming up in just a second, to help identify where everyone here is coming from. All right, so you can see your poll there, and um, you could select one of those under what do you measure, and in like you some time to select your answer, and then we'll be able to share out the results. Okay, so it looks like the healthy eating is definitely far and away the most popular thing that's being measured and with academic improvement and engagement from a close second and kind of the other three in a in the mix there. And I think you'll find that all of our um, different case studies will look at different aspects of um, with what we measure here at the different organizations. I think that's it's for my piece right here, John. 
All right. Yeah. So we're going to uh, turn it over to May from Garden Years, and she's going to share a case study and how they take evaluation and turn it into action. Hi, everybody. My name is May. I'm the executive director and co-founder of Garden Years. We're based in Chicago. Um, I just some quick background. Um, I was a teacher for seven years. So while Garden Years um, does actually do some evaluation, specifically just around similar to what our poll showed, one of our big um, evaluations is fruit and veggie preference and consumption, which it sounds like you all are also doing. Um, we also um, do another thing, um, and that is effectiveness of the um, instructor. So we we measure fruit and vegetable preference, and we have a um, a curriculum that. Oh, you know what? I need to move slides. Sorry, guys. Um, we we measure. Um, uh, like I said, we measure, measure fruit and veggie consumption, um, and we also present a curriculum, just similar probably to all of you um, in our school gardens, um, that focuses on um, our specific pillars, um, a lot of which are nutrition and healthy eating. And um, while we have this curriculum that's, that all of our instructors provide, we were finding that we were getting vastly different results. And so we started to look, and this is a lot of my teaching background, um, at the effectiveness of the of the instructor. Um, so we created a tool uh, to standardize this, while well, we have a standardized curriculum and varying instructors, we created a tool that would help us do kind of an internal evaluation of our program execution. Um, and how this works is we have a program manager that goes in and does an observation feedback cycle with our garden educators. Um, so our garden educators, just through our model, they are people who are in the schools from our staff. We don't actually utilize teachers within the schools. We have our garden educators who teach kids. Um, so our program managers will go in and do observations of the program and the, they have a rubric that they use, which I'll show on the next slide, um, that allows us to do a very standardized um, evaluation of the effectiveness of the, the curriculum. Um, this, just a note, this also can be used uh, with classroom teachers. So if you are a support organization, per, per, perhaps that um, provides a curriculum to classroom teachers to teach in the garden, you as a support organization could also use something like a rubric, a standardized rubric to ensure that this hands-on, a lot of times hands-on um, experiential learning is happening at a very high level uh, within the garden classroom. So on the next slide, um, if it will go forward, there we go. On the next slide, you will see the tool that we use. So um, on the right side, you'll see there's a goal setting and a learning and an observation and data collection and then a reflection. And that really makes up the observation feedback cycle that a lot of educators use um, to uh, gain professional experience. And um, so we have, um, we evaluate three things. Instruction, instructional preparation, lesson execution, and classroom management within the garden setting. Um, we also um, have had some challenges and some successes around this. Um, and I think some of the biggest challenges that we have had is um, the actual program manager that's consistently using it. So we do have three different program managers that go into schools and do this. And so depending on their um, familiarity with the tool, they might make, focus on different things with the gar different garden educators. So that consistency piece. And then also that one size fits all. We have, we're in 26 gardens in Chicago. So sometimes um, that one size fits all approach doesn't work because our schools are very vastly different because they're in different communities around the city. So that was some of the challenges, but we also have had a lot of successes. And one of the biggest successes and the, the reason that we're committed to continuously using this tool and updating it and doing more iterations of it is because that we have seen an increase in our um, fruit and veggie consumption and preferences or with our kids. So while we're using the same curriculum, we're finding an increase in the data. Maybe it's because we're becoming better um, teachers and our garden educators are becoming teachers. And I think a lot of that is due to this tool and the feedback and the reflection cycle. 
And then lastly, one of the biggest successes we've had is around um, garden educator empowerment. They feel, our garden educators are feeling very good about their, their, their time in the classroom with kids. They feel like they're becoming better educators. They feel like their kids are learning more around health and nutrition, and they're, they're really making the change that we want to see that um, our mission is here to serve. So it's been a really fun journey, and we're, we're definitely going to keep doing iterations of the tool. But you have this tool in the handout section. It's under Gardeners Observation Rubric, uh, Spring. It says Spring. I definitely didn't type the type Spring. I put Spring under the document. But you can definitely access that. And if you have any questions about it, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, so that's all about um, the garden years and some of the internal evaluations we do around uh, instructor effectiveness. Um, we're going to go ahead and do the next poll, um, and that is why do you measure? So yeah, um, Tristan, if you want to uh, go ahead and administer the poll, and everyone can answer. All right. So looks like most people are looking to assess the effectiveness of their program model and their execution with 42% and a good tie there for sharing stories with funders and justifying replication and growth of your program. So I love it that people are looking to see how their model is actually running. I think that's a really great one to be measuring looking at your effectiveness of your program model. So with that, um, thank you all for sharing on the poll. I'm going to allow Susanna from Common Ground in Connecticut to share a little bit more about evaluation and assessment by sharing out their case studies. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here with everyone today. My name is Susanna Holsebeck, and I'm the School Yards Program Manager at Common Ground. We're a high school urban farm and environmental education center. So I manage the outward facing work with our Connecticut School Garden Resource Center, also known as the School Yards Program. And we have hands on management of school gardens, school yard habitats, and outdoor classrooms in 18 New Haven public schools in New Haven, Connecticut. And then we also serve as a hub for the state for school garden and school yard habitat work. And Susanna, I'd like to remind you to click show screen in your control panel so we can see your slide, or I can share your slides if you'd like. That would be great. It's it's showing me that I am showing my screen. So uh, then let's see. We'll show uh, here we go. There you are. There Perfect. we are. Okay. So I have I have the control now. <laughs> okay. Apologies for that. Um, so we measure lots of different things, but today I wanted to focus on our needs assessment, which is something that we do with school sites um, when we initially partner with them. So it's either administered as an application or once we've agreed to partner, um, we work with the school to administer a needs assessment to various um, uh, stakeholders. And John, I'm actually gonna have you click the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna switch presenting to me. Sorry. 
can share. That's fine. This is part of our world, this technical difficulties. Wonderful. Thank you. And then we can actually, yeah, this is the slide we want. Excellent. Thank you so much, John. So um, as I was saying before, the needs assessment uh, we uh, administer at the very beginning of our relationship with a site. Um, and ideally, it's administered to various stakeholders who will be participating in the garden. Administrators, teachers, parents, students, paras, the custodian, uh, anybody who might have a hand in it, you name it. Um, hopefully, we're getting some data from them. And the goal is really to get some baseline data um, on what the school values, what the community of the school um, feels is important. And we find that when we have the answers to that, um, we're more effective in supporting the school in designing, building, maintaining, and utilizing the garden. Um, so whether it's curricular, health, behavioral, um, whether their goal is around community building, um, whether it's around building stewardship of environmental resources. Once we know that that's their goal, then that's what we're going to measure moving forward so that our measurement is both useful to us on a program side, are we successful with our support, but also useful to the school so they can see this is, we, we are achieving change um, when we uh, do these things with our garden or our schoolyard or our outdoor um, classroom space. Um, and the needs assessments vary, um, and the questions that we ask on the needs assessments vary based on um, who we end up uh, surveying. So uh, sometimes we don't have access to all the folks we'd love to survey. Um, so if it's just administrators and teachers, we have a set of questions that we like to ask them. If it includes students, um, we have questions that we ask them. So it is more of a dynamic uh, process. Um, and if anybody has questions about what that looks like, I'm more than happy to go into more detail, um, either on this, on this webinar or offline. My contact information is on the first intro slide with my name. Um, so I'm going to move on to the poll. We'd love to know who are you primarily gathering your data from directly? Um, so take some time to answer that question. Wow, it looks like youth and uh, children and teachers and administrators are tied. Um, it looks like from this group, those are the two most important groups that we're gathering data from. Um, program staff comes in a second and then parents and community members are a third. So really interesting results with the, the tie for, for youth and teachers. I think that makes sense. This is John, <laughs> these are both uh, critical people. As we're, we're developing our programs. We're finding that teachers are great to really understand and make sure our programs are, are meeting their needs so that they can then serve the children. So we've, I think I've talking in relation to our programs right now, we're looking at teachers as our primary audience, but I know we're gonna move towards children as we figure that out. <laughs> So with that, Susanna, thank you uh, for sharing. I'm going to pass it on to Robin. And Robin, you are going to now be able to share your screen if you're ready to do that and share a little bit about your case study. And there it goes. And now you're out. There you go, Robin. I just unmuted. Okay. Great. 
Um, hello again, everyone. Um, Robin Burns, Program Director at City Sprouts, and a little bit more about City Sprouts. So we're an organization that's based in Cambridge and Boston. We work primarily with uh, public schools in both cities and primarily with pre-K through eighth grade. And we have two core programs. One's a school partnership program, which essentially takes place during the school day, direct collaboration with teachers. And we have 12 schools in each city that we'll be partnering with um, starting with next school year. And then we have a middle school after school program and summer programming, which I'm not gonna talk about today. However, I just did wanna mention that for us and in, in terms of um, who we are gathering data from, for our middle school program, we're able to collect a lot of youth level data. However, for a school partnership program, which I'll be speaking to, we mainly get data from the teachers. And I'll tell you more about that in a second. So uh, again, looking at the same five uh, categories that the other case studies we're looking at on the right hand side here, what we measure, who we collect from, what tools we're using, who we're sharing with, and the key successes and challenges. It's going to be the framework for what I'll share here. And so for us, the pretty much key data source for us is our teacher survey, uh, the information that we glean from the teacher survey. And so that's actually something that we are in the middle of administering this year. Um, we just rolled that out a couple weeks back and we're hoping to close out that process um, in the coming week. And what that looks like is we reach out to all of the teachers that we partner with at all of our partner schools. We try to uh, hone the number a little bit um, because some of our schools are so broad that our coordinators don't necessarily have the time to intersect with all the teachers at the school, but we definitely want to be hearing from teachers, uh, even if they're not using the garden and why, and then also a lot of teachers use the garden independently while we're not there. And so we also want to kind of find out some more of that information. Um, so we're measuring the garden usage, student impact, and how the garden is thought of as a resource for teachers. And we have a, a series of questions and there's actually, to give a plug to the resources in the control panel sidebar, there's actually a copy of our 2017 teacher survey that folks can look at to find out some more specific information. Um, and so yeah, again, we're collecting data from, from our teachers and we don't have any youth level data for our school partnership program. And we also collect information from our garden coordinators. So our garden coordinators um, use Salesforce and they have um, a piece of Salesforce called their garden coordinator logs or what we just simply refer to as our GC logs. And so our GC logs combined with the teacher survey results really help to tell the story about our organization. And the garden coordinators are keeping track of all of their teacher interactions. They're looking at um, teacher planning, co-teaching, um, evidence of peer-to-peer -peer where teachers are supporting each other um, around using the garden. And we also document all the specific activities that we're doing in the garden, which then helps us just internally from year to year. Um, and one really valuable thing that we were able to do this year was we were able to use the garden coordinator logs in Salesforce and connect those to the teacher survey. So for this year, we were able to send individual unique links to each teacher for them to complete a survey uh, directly. And then that gets put into their contact in Salesforce. And we're able to aggregate all of that in a much smoother way. So we're rolling that out this year for the first time kind of in mass. And we're running into a few uh, glitches and we'll definitely be thinking about how we can tweak it and move it in a more positive direction next year. However, we've had some really great results and we're kind of excited in, in the direction it's going. It takes away a lot of staff time for compiling um, paper copies um, that we have still had to use some paper copies as well. Um, and we share these results with you know similar group of folks that lots of other um, organizations would staff board and externally to partners and funders. And again, here's the teacher survey, just a quick snap of it. And then also I have the snapshot from the past full school year, which is also available in the resources on the side of the screen. And lastly, I just wanted to review the successes. So it was a really big deal for us to get the new online survey up and running, get the staff comfortable with administering it. And uh, we were able to work with a uh, 
pro bono consulting group that really helped us get that off the ground and um, feel really comfortable rolling that out this year. And then it's really helped us compile a really big data set that we're using to get a sense of our programs. And the nice thing is that because it, we're kind of moving away from more of that kind of paper copying and then kind of transcribing all of that after the teachers complete the survey, it's going to help us with a little quicker turnaround to share out the results to our schools and to our partners. Um, and of course, the challenge is uh, many teachers are really busy. Lots of other partners are also asking them to complete surveys. So we definitely run into a challenge there. And um, we've been fortunate that most of our principals are really supportive partners to City Sprouts. And so they're really helping us get some of this information from teachers and helping find staff time to do that. And so we really appreciate those um, levels of support. And then also our staff are busy running their program in the garden, maintaining the garden and doing all that they do to get ready for a summer program. So for them, you know, there's just sometimes issues around just having the time within our organization to both facilitate the survey process and the data management collection in a very clear and smooth way while also taking on all the other pieces and I already alluded to the technical challenges. Great. So I think that wraps it up for the little City Sprouts case study. Wonderful. So we are going to now move on to Meg from the Ecology Center. And Meg, I will share my screen for you to run through slides and share with us. Let me get that ready. And as our presenters have been uh, mentioning, we have lots of copies of our surveys and the tools that we use in the handout section in your control panel to the right and then also on our website and forum we have a best practice document that links through to many of these resources and we will end today by sharing more resources than you'll know what to do with with that meg um how about you go on and share a little bit about how you all do assessment great thanks so much john um so i'm meg Hesinger, and i am our director of community engagement at the ecology center we're located in San Juan Capistrano in Orange County, which is in Southern California, just between south of Los Angeles and north of San Diego. Um, and I also, I'm here to talk today about a program that I started here about six years ago called Grow Your Own. Uh, and it's a school garden support program. So next slide, please. There we are. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> this is more kind of reference notes um, on what I'm going to talk about, but if you can flip to the picture of the Ecology Center, I can share a little bit about us and grow your own. So this is a picture of our site. Um, we are located in a historic farmhouse and have about an acre of farm and gardens. And our whole idea is to become a regional model and ultimately a national model for hands-on education around sustainability for all ages. So um, like I said, uh, about six years ago, we started the Grow Your Own Garden program kind of in response to a need from the community around us. So we were having school gardens come to us and say, hey, we have a garden, but nobody's using it. And you know, the principal's threatening to pave it over if we don't do something, that kind of thing. So we basically piloted this program with a couple of these leaders. Um, with the program has changed every year, uh, kind of based on the changing needs and feedback from the teacher community that we work with. So we started out hands-on with three schools and we now work hands-on with 50. Um, the goal of the program became pretty clear. So when we first started, we were going into schools and kind of teaching lessons ourselves to the kids. And when we start, first started evaluating, we were directly serving the kids, you know, kind of quick quizzes on what did you know about this before? What did you, what do you know after to, to get a sense of retention? And then we quickly realized that, that our focus actually was on building sustainable community around gardens, that our real work was in um, 
those in supporting the garden leaders to create systems in their garden so that they would be able to maintain themselves year, year in and year out. So we realized that actually the kids weren't the people that we wanted to be evaluating anymore. Um, we can flip to the next slide, please. John, can we flip to the next slide? Yeah, I believe I did. Oh. Go your own. Cool. Is it? No, it doesn't really matter. Um, okay, so so here we are. Um, so. Grow Your Own has grown, and, and like I said, we engage about 50 schools hands-on. Um, we've designed about 20 and helped build, um, and we've trained over 200 teachers. And with all of that, we, like I said, we've been kind of responding to community needs and also our own funding flows year after year. So we, we developed this core set of tools. So we've got, got teacher trainings that are hands-on, we developed basic curriculum for students and also for teachers that lives online. Um, we also do site visits, which mainly I implement sometimes with a crew of a uh, team of uh, coordinators. And that's kind of our main tools. So with that, we've kind of ebbed and flowed. And the question is, how do we measure this thing that we're claiming to do, which is to build overall sustainability in a school garden program when we use a really diverse multi-pronged approach that we know is effective, um, how do we go beyond testimonials? So as you can see, um, we obviously count. We count how many, how many schools participate in our programs. I, I keep my own document, which I report to funders, that goes a little more detailed than that. So um, I have about five or six kinds of touch points that, that we offer, like I mentioned, the site visits, the teacher trainings, networking events. So when a school participates in any one of those, I, I document that they've engaged in that way and I kind of count touch points across schools. So those 50 schools so far are ones that have all engaged in at least three hands-on ways. So I wanted to talk about um, kind of an experiment that we're doing right now to go deeper and to really be able to tell our story um, in, a, in an even deeper, more quantified way, um, and yet still capture the complexity of the change that we're bringing about over time. Um, so we had a funder this year who's been an awesome partner of ours for the last three, four years, familiar with our work, who said, okay, this is amazing. I just saw your presentation. I want to continue to invest. And you're trying to go from build your network from 50 to 100 schools this year. I want to see your plan of how you're going to do that and really, um, and really document in an organized way that, this, that you're making this change. So we came up with this system of tiers. And the idea is that every school is starting at a different place. But we think one of the things that we're really good at is in mapping out kind of an overall journey. It's a bit of a choose your own. It's got different branches, but we think we can see an overall pattern in the, the process that a school needs to go to, be, to build a sustainable garden and, and what the steps are. So we said, okay, there's we kind of made three basic categories or tiers, so we call them. Um, and we basically put each school we said, we think you're, you're here, and these are the steps in each of the next tiers that you need to mark in order to really show that, you're, that you've got the effective systems in place. So our idea was that, that we would give schools, um, we, would, we would work with schools, take a baseline survey, um, which we do through a Google Doc, and, and assess where they're starting from, have them just check off the boxes. Then um, we decided, you know, let's take this a step further. We've done something like this in the past, but let's, let's create a report card and actually be more proactive with them and say, hey, here's based on your response, here's where we think you are right now. This is your garden sustainability report card. These are the two or three next steps that we think that you can take to move, your, move the needle across these three areas and go to the next level of sustainability. And then, then it's taking the, the um, 
pulse again at the end of the year. Did you move the needle? If so, great. Then we have incentives like coming and giving you free um, hands-on garden classes or a free teacher training. So really um, motivating the schools that are actually doing the work, I guess. So, so like I said, we've done we've done the tier system already, and now we're adding on this more interactive report card. And um, stay tuned. <laughs> so, I just wanted to kind of share that it's a little bit of a work in progress, but um, just kind of wanted to open up. I think one of the things that we do really well is um, is you know we've seen that we've got schools in our community for six, you know, five, six years now that are coming back and teaching other schools and are kind of don't need us anymore. Um, and so it's exciting that we're having real impact. And I think because it's so, it's so many ways that we're touching in on each school um, over so many years, and we have such a small staff that I think our challenge is to find a really um, uh, effective way aside from photographs and powerful case uh, narratives to to quantify that impact in a better way so thank you all right was that it meg yes wonderful so now um well thank you all presenters for sharing your case studies now now we're going to share a little kind of overview on some of the um greater resources that we collected in some insight when we thought about evaluation tools. And I'm gonna invite um, Susanna back on, who is a part of our Leadership Institute um, of School Garden Support Organization Leadership Institute last December, um, and kind of came up with some of these um, tips and factors to consider when you're selecting an evaluation tool. And then we're gonna um, close out by sharing uh, more resources and um, I grabbed a screenshot of an incredible resource that we put together um, that helps us decide what kind of tool to use and then we'll go for questions. So Susanna, are you able to jump on? And Great. She, there you are. Great. Hi again. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so yeah, so this is a series of questions that we came up with in December um, and uh, it's sort of a checklist for SGSOs to go through when they're choosing an evaluation tool. So um, thinking about organizational capacity, how many staff members do you have? Do they actually have the time to collect data and then follow up with that data, evaluate it, do the data entry? Um, depending on what kind of tool you're using, maybe that's really time intensive. So we've maybe all been in that case where we, we get a whole bunch of data back, but then we don't have the time to look at it. So really considering organizational capacity is important. Um, obviously, what outcomes are you measuring? Um, you wanna know that. Um, who is your target group? And this is important because depending on who your target group is, that might influence uh, the type of evaluation that you use. Maybe it needs to be translated into a different language. Maybe it should be handwritten and not online. Um, really knowing who you're, who you're targeting is important. Um, how you will use the information resulting from this information or re resulting from this evaluation. So are you using it just internally to know whether your program is working? Are you sharing it with funders? Are you sharing it back with the folks that answered the questions that you asked? Um, really important in considering that and, and, and what kind of backend design you want for that tool, which can also save staff time. So if you ask that first question, what's my organizational capacity, and um, you come up with, we really don't have a lot of time, um, thinking about creative ways to partner with folks who do measurement and evaluation for a living or um, as part of an academic trajectory. So um, just speaking for common ground specifically, our school yards program partnered with a measurement team at the University of Connecticut this year to look at developing an evaluation around using gardens as um, behavioral intervention resources. Um, so we didn't have the knowledge to really delve into a lot of that. And so it was invaluable to have UConn um, partner with us on that. And then finally, um, what kind of technology systems and um, other uh, media are you are needed to support the data collection and analysis process? Do you have that already? Do you have it in your budget to get it? And then how? what's your plan for sharing those evaluation results? 
um, and should that be built into the analysis of your data. So that's just a quick run through of um, hopefully some helpful questions to ask yourself in your organization before you choose an evaluation tool. All right, thank you, Susanna. And uh, this slide here just shows an example of some of the resources that we're sharing on our best, best practices document. So once again, we had a School Garden Support Organization Leadership Institute in December of 2016 with uh, about 35 organizations and we put all of our common knowledge together and made best practices documents on various key activities that school garden support orgs uh, operate in and these are some of the examples and resources that support this topic of uh, impact uh, managing uh, assessing impact and, and sharing it as well so um, i'm not going to go into all these um, in detail um, but just to let you know that in the handout section, um, in your control panel there to the right, you can find some of these handouts, but even more documents exist on our website. If you go to nationalschoolgardennetwork.org and click on the webinars button, you could link to our forum, or if you're already on our forum, you can go directly to our forum and find the thread that's on best practices in measuring impact. And you could, link through to all these examples and resources that we have. Um, I do want to share, I grabbed a screenshot of one of the most exciting things. It's not the best image quality here, um, but our team during our Leadership Institute created this incredible chart. Um, and this is just this yellow and green part that got cut off because I wanted to make it big enough, um, is looking at most of the outcomes on the left-hand column. So for example, vegetable outcome would be an outcome and then what we measure. So what are the questions or what are we looking at um, to judge that um, particular outcome? And then it goes on and has a whole chart of the different types of tools that our group and others like yourself use to evaluate that outcome. So it's a really great tool if you're looking at this more systematically or, or broad to see what kind of questions, what are we gonna measure to um, particularly find an outcome. So I encourage you to check out our forum and share your own resources if you have some to share um, or look deeper into our best practices document. And just so, to share that, that document that John just highlighted is um, in your handout section if you'd like it right now. It's the measurement tools chart, just to share. Thank you, Tristana. Wonderful. So there's a lot of great resources out there. You are all, everybody here, the 120 people that we have on the webinar today are all a resource. And some of your questions uh, um, let us know that because um, the types of questions you're asking are really targeted and specific to the work we're doing. So I'm going to put out these questions to our presenters um, and then let our presenters jump in. So I'm unmuting all of our presenters right now. So here's a question. Uh, someone wanted to find out what kind of rate of um, return are you getting from your teachers and how are you encouraging your teachers to actually answer surveys? And I'll answer that first with the school garden support organization that we run in Watsonville. We actually have our garden educator bring the surveys out to the teachers because in our community, we noticed our teachers aren't very savvy with online tools. Uh, so we bring a paper copy when the teacher's at the garden and hand it to the teacher and say, hey, please fill out this pre and then at the end of the year post survey. So if anybody else wants to jump on and share how they encourage their um, teachers to um, answer surveys and give feedback and um, also share about your rate of return. And I'll just let you guys choose yourselves to share out. This, this is, is Robin. Robin. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Susanna. Um, just really quickly, um, it's Tiffy Sprouts. Um, you know, I mentioned we were piloting this year um, our kind of Salesforce link teacher surveys. That every teacher got an individual link. Um, definitely similar to what John said. Definitely harder sometimes to get teachers to um, perhaps to focus on the City Sprouts email. Um, can't really speak to how they are with their email in general. But um, but what I mentioned before, we really have a lot of partnership from our principals so they back us up and our garden coordinators are at each of their schools twice a week so they are checking in with teachers and following up and so this year we really tried to be amenable to different options so we had both the 
um, the online version and then we had paper copies and everyone's gotten those paper copies. And um, for return rate for us uh, this past year, we were somewhere between 85 and 90 percent return rate. And so that's that's the city press one. And sorry, I'll step back, Susanna, if you want to say a few things. Pretty much echoing what you just said, Robin, um, we've actually had success partnering with principals as well and getting them to devote five to 10 minutes in a faculty meeting for teachers for the whole school to respond. Um, and that does mean that we've switched back to paper copy, so more data entry on the other end, but it means that our response rate has gone way up. So it's you give, you give some, you lose some, um, but at the end we get the data that we want. This is Meg. Um, we've done a couple of different things and nothing is foolproof, but one of the things we did is um, for a time, we, uh, we basically, even though it was a free program that we funded through grants that we got, we put a monetary value to it and, and made schools sign an agreement in the beginning saying, hey, we're gonna help you for two years. This is what we give you through the help. This is what we expect and basically it included you're going to fill out a beginning and end of year survey um, so that kind of made them take it seriously like when we gave them the reminder hey you haven't filled out this survey it was like oh yeah <laughs> um, and then we also wherever possible would go deliver it in person and now when we don't now that we've got more schools we we create incentives so we partner with companies like compost companies etc and get donations from them or local nurseries and then we offer like you know cards and compost and tools and stuff like that that we get free to give as incentives to schools that uh, complete their surveys great any other presenters want to share how they encourage um, responses in their surveys I will then ask another question, and this one was originally directed for um, gardeners, but I have a feeling all of our presenters might have uh, something to share on this. So the question was, do you observe your instructors uh, teaching to assess them? Um, and what's your system for going about um, training teachers? So how do you prepare teachers or your garden educators to train and then when you're observing them, what do you do? Do you watch them or what other methods do you assess your educators with? Um, so, hi everyone. Um, so, you're asking if we, if our garden educators also teach teachers? Um, well, the, the question is, um, how do you prepare your educators, whether those are garden educators or teachers? And okay. And then how do you assess those people that are doing the teaching, whether those are garden educators or teachers? So okay, depending yep. on your model might be different. Great, so we, we actually t t train our garden educators in our curriculum by having, we have three intensive, like full day trainings um, a, a, a season. So that's one in the spring, one in the summer, and one before the fall season starts. We don't uh, grow in Chicago in the winter. Um, and then we do weekly staff meetings. Um, so the gardeners spend, the garden educators spend about a week uh, or an hour per week where we do a full like new lesson rollout and we practice role playing the lessons so that, or they, and they make any um, different modifications for the grade level they're teaching. So that happens kind of a, um, a, a weekly touch point and then those intensive um, um, seasonal um, rollouts. And that's how we kind of train them in the curriculum. And then we evaluated them using the observation rubric that I shared. So um, garden, garden program managers go in and do a, a half an hour to a 45 minute observation on the instruction and the execution of lessons using the rubric. And then they have a sit down right after the lesson with the garden educator. And they talk about the, they, they discuss the, the lesson um, using the rubric and then they reflect reflect on it and they set goals for the next one. So if two of the um, sections were, you know, below expectations or, you know, they both felt that they weren't that great that day, they'll talk through them and they'll set goals around those specific things for the next lesson. Um, and garden educators are observed usually, depending on the need, um, once every other week uh, for effectiveness of lesson execution. And I believe that this model can work um, for teachers that are also providing garden education in their classrooms. Um, 
depending on you know what organization you are and depending on um, what curriculum you provide to your your school to support organization uh, you can help make ensure their execution of the hands-on experiential learning which is different than a lot of teachers um, at least in CPS schools um, help guide them through that process Does anyone want to else any other presenters want to share how they um, prepare their educators and evaluate them? Um, this is Robin again from City Sprouts. So I can quickly say that um, our model is a little bit different. All of our we don't have any um, any curriculum that we are bringing to our school partners. So we're actually sitting down with the teachers and finding curriculum connections with their existing curriculum. And so what we do is that we really have it all be based on that collaboration with the teacher and our individual garden coordinator, who's a staff person at City Sprouts. And we have a team of six garden coordinators. So there's definitely a lot of shared um, experiences and we really try to support the community of practice within our garden coordinator team. So we might have a, a garden coordinator that sits down with a second grade teacher who might be interested in a math connection and our garden coordinator might not necessarily be able to kind of offer up a suggestion right away about a garden connection, but usually what we're able to do is kind of amongst our crew of folks, um, kind of get some shared, you know, what's worked in the past, but then the idea is that the teacher always gets the final sign off. Um, so sometimes, you know, the teacher might lead with an idea or to try out something, sometimes the garden coordinator leads on it, but it's always linked back to their existing curriculum. All right. So I'm going to put out two more questions and then we'll close our webinar. I do want to note that many people have asked in the questions for us to share like tools and resources that we use, our checklists, our surveys. And our goal is to share as much as possible so that you all as school garden support orgs do not have to reinvent the wheel. So we will look at those requests and um, when available, share those back out. Um, here's another question. Someone asked what kind of polls polling tools do you use? So, and specifically, like, what did we use for today's webinar? So for today's webinar, it's just the polling system that's built into GoToWebinar. Um, and, and then other tools I could mention that we've used um, would be like SurveyMonkey or Fluid Surveys. And now Google, um, Google Forms actually has a polling tool now as well. So do any of our, um, other presenters have any other polling or survey tools that they find useful that they use? Did someone mention SurveyMonkey already? SurveyMonkey is definitely a great one out there, yep. So I'll add to this um, discussion question too uh, by noting that some of the more guys maybe long standing or, or school garden support orgs that might have a little more funding to invest in a CRM or a client relationship manager tool like a Salesforce or Neon or Razor's Edge. Sometimes they're they're paired with donor or fundraising software tools. They'll also have modules built in to do surveys and polling that you can manage all your people. Um, this idea of um, client or constituent relationship management tools is a topic that we're thinking about offering as a webinar um, next year to find out what, what are the tools that our school garden support orgs are using to do the work that we're doing from assessing to tracking program management all the way to uh, fundraising. So that is something we're thinking about sharing out and it ranges greatly from free tools to ones that are, you know, lots of money. Um, so with that, um, I see one last question um, that's somewhat related to, to our assessment, uh, um, but, but a little bit more on program management. And the question was for everybody, and we'll end with this question, are your programs um, fee for service or are they free for your partners? So I'll just call out folks um, and just have you go down to share a little bit about briefly um, how your school pays or not pays for the programs that you're bringing to them. So I'll start with May. Um, we are um, mostly, uh, mostly it's free service. We do a sliding scale about 20, uh, of our 26 schools, about 25% of the funding actually comes from the school. The rest comes from 
private donors, um, corporate sponsors, um, grants. Thank you. And Meg, how do your school gardens um, pay or receive the programs that you yes. offer? Um, we, we kind of designed a core that would be free, even if we got no funding for the program, that's basically staff time and stuff we already developed. So like online resource bank, t uh, quarterly teacher trainings, uh, that kind of thing are, there's this, they're all free, but then we've got paid options. So like, if you want a free teacher training, you can come here and do it once a quarter. Or if you want one at your campus whenever you want, then that would be a paid thing that we can also do. Thank you. And Robin? Yeah, so we have a service contract with all of our schools, so they all do pay. Um, we, it ends up working to about a third of the overall cost to run the program. Um, and the two cities that we work in, it's slightly different. In Cambridge, we're fortunate to be a line item in the district budget. So we get all Ooh. of the schools are, um, included in the um, from the district funds and then in boston we go school to school with um, service contracts for each for each school but then again it pays for just about a third of the overall cost of running the program at that school and then as may said we fill that the rest of that in with kind of some more typical um kind of um school garden support organization or nonprofit um fundraising okay and susanna we'll end with you Yes, we are a combination of all of the above. So with our New Haven schools, it's primarily grant funded from a variety of grants. Um, and then we also do fee for service work as well. So it's it's a combo. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you um, presenters for sharing your models and your insight. And thank you audience for hanging on with us for a little bit over an hour. Um, I did include that last question was wasn't necessarily directly related to impact, but um, so many school garden support organizations are interested in that question as they continue to develop their models. I do want to point out that that is a question that was discussed um, on a prior webinar that we had, which was on sustaining and institutionalizing school garden support organization work. Um, and the screen up here has the website where you can find our archives and sign up for future webinars. So we thank you very much for joining us on this very informative webinar, and we look forward to seeing you in person or on our forum. Thanks a lot. And take care.